The majority of inshore saltwater anglers who go out fishing on any given weekend end up catching less fish than they want, most of them getting skunked. And the only reason is because they're fishing in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Well, the great news is we have some new software that literally predicts exactly what day and time of day to fish in your area and we top it off by actually getting on satellite maps every single Friday morning and showing you exactly where to fish based on real time trends and weather in your area to catch redfish and speckled trout, snook and flounder. So if that sounds like something that you like that you benefit from, come join us in the Salt Strong Insider Club. It is guaranteed to help you catch more fish on your next trip or you don't pay. Go to saltstrong.com, look up at the top and you'll see a join now button and join us and the 30,000 other anglers in this amazing club. See you in there soon. It's fishing, it's in my soul. Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds, back again. Got Justin, got Pat. We're talking about the thing that kills more trout and even more redfish than, than most things out there. And it's, we're not talking about dolphins and sharks or pollution. We're not talking about rockets falling from the sky. We're talking about human beings, people, us. This is a great reminder right now. I, this is probably one of the highest peaks overall of boaters and anglers, in particular new boaters and anglers, but even experienced anglers need a, a great reminder on this. And uh, uh, there's the pulse for us, right? We have a, a private online community and, and we're pretty quick to, uh, to help coach people in the nice way there if we see some kind of mishandling. Uh, but the Facebook group, you know, there's 85,000 or so people in there. And I feel like there's been an increase on the amount of fish that are like way mishandled. And obviously if you're taking it home to fry it up, we even have my little toefish spatula here. Uh, that's all fine and dandy. Uh, but there's many times where someone even says, hey, this was released safely. And from the looks of the picture, like, oh, man, it's bad. I know we had a trout expert from Texas A&M on, and they talked about just the, the mortality rate. It's sky high when people are putting hands up in gills and putting pliers way down the throat. Like, it's almost like with trout, almost like a 0% chance survival rate if you start doing that. Even if you see them swim off they are going to end up dying shortly after. It was pretty interesting because they, they follow these things in a, in a uh, somewhat, I guess, uh, monitored area or a, or a pool of, a, of salt water to watch them and see what really happens. And uh, it was very, very eye-opening and all that study is published. But uh, the two of these gentlemen here brought it up and said, man, it's a great reminder. We don't, you know, we probably don't do enough conservation catch and release issues. And Talk about some of the biggest mistakes. And, and a lot of them happen, you know, even in kayaks, right? Uh, so I, I know Pat and Justin, you guys want to hammer that. Who wants to kick this thing off? What, was, there, was there a catalyst where you saw someone do something really bad or yourself, perhaps? Yeah, actually, actually the catalyst uh, was, uh, you know, I don't know. Insiders probably know this already, but uh, in a recent fishing trip, I caught this massive trout. I caught a giant um, upper 20-inch trout. Uh, we don't know how big that was because... Uh, it managed to get away from me. Uh, you know, I didn't, uh, I wasn't prepared to handle it properly and it flopped out of the kayak before I got the measurement. So, you know, that's one of the things that we kind of uh, spurred along. What's the, what's the right way of handling a fish? Uh, you know, is it different uh, for different species? Is it different for different uh, vessels that you're in? You know, do you handle a trout differently from a kayak? or while you're waiting, or when you're in a boat, what does that look like? What's the proper tools that we're using? And, you know, we kind of, you know, bounced around the idea between, well, what is the right way? And I think we're all on the same, you know, uh, idea of, you know, that we, we have to be careful with these fish and we have to make sure that we're protecting them. But, you know, what is the right way of doing this? Now, in this this particular situation, you had know, to kind of, you know, get to, you know, the, the point of where I was, uh, when I was reeling the fish in, uh, normally what I do is I have a pair of lip rippers that are right in my uh, compartment next to my, my right leg. And I usually use those. If it's a large fish, I'll lip rip them, support them by the belly, and then and then pull them up that way. Well, my lip rippers weren't there. I, I don't know what happened to them. I think they fell underneath my seat. Well, I wind up using my net. Now, the problem is, is whenever you're you're dealing with a large fish like this in a large net, 
in a small kayak, you kind of run out of room. And uh, that led to me kind of, um, it led to me putting my hands in a position where I could have done better. Uh, you know, I didn't do any damage to the fish. I, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, tip the gills or anything like that. But my hands were further up the, the gill plate than I thought they were. And I didn't realize this until I saw the video afterwards. And, you know, this just led to this conversation of, you know, one, be prepared and have all the right tools. But again, what is the right way of doing this? So game film, essentially, looking back at the video, you realized your uh, hands were up in the in the gill plate. So what what is the answer? Uh, it, it sounds like be more prepared is one. Yeah. Yes, be, be prepared. Have everything that you need uh, to handle that fish, to measure the fish, to take that picture, everything that you need right there in front of you. And if it's possible, leave the fish in the water for as long as you can before you even bring that fish aboard to do all that stuff. So have everything set up, have all your tools beforehand, make sure they're they're out there. It's like, you know, uh, race car drivers like NASCAR, the pit crews, every pit crew, they reset exactly the way that they're supposed to be. So you catch a fish, put everything, all your tools back exactly where they're supposed to be. So when that next fish comes aboard, you know where all your tools are. Yep. Yeah, it's it's interesting to you know, fish with guys like Peter Deeks. He, you know, he's caught many state records, so he's he's preparing everything, even potential if he needs a certain IGFA, you know, scale or or whatever a ruler. I mean, he he's got everything. So when he he knows when someone's got a, a potential record fish, or even just a PB or a monster trout or a monster snook, and if you watch him, if if you're fighting, you obviously wouldn't see it if you're fighting the fish. But behind the scenes, he's getting everything ready because he also likes to get pictures, right? It's, it helps his business out. All his his customers want to have a picture. But the last thing you want to do is be sitting there holding a trophy redfish or trout out of the water for an extended amount of time because you're fumbling around. So he literally has everything there from the from the fish grips or book grip to a net if he needs it to his phone unlocked, right? Because even with slimy fingers, all of a sudden you're sitting there trying to unlock your phone. I mean, all these little things add up. Uh, especially if you're fighting a trophy fish, which is many times kind of fighting to the death. And we don't think about that, right? Because I, I love what you you mentioned there, Pat, about even letting the fish fish almost have a breather if you don't have your stuff ready, or even if you do, letting it sit there in the net or with fish grips and then pulling it out for a quick pick and putting it right back in versus it's, I mean, think about fighting someone, right? Like to the death, like you're literally fighting to the point you can barely breathe anymore. And then you get pushed underwater. Like it would be almost yeah. the opposite, right? I mean, you, you're, yeah. this fish is fighting to the death and all of a sudden then we're taken out of the water, like just like slapping in the face one more time. So I, uh, I think that's a, a great tip. What, what about you, Justin? So fish handling, what we kind of talked about offline here was that every species is a little bit different in how you handle them. Across the board, yes. I think now in today's day and age, a lot of people know that you know, supporting the fish right here at the neck, whether it's on a lip gripper or it's up underneath the chin and supporting the belly, holding the fish horizontally is rule number one with really any size fish. doesn't matter whether it's a 18 inch trout or it's a 30 inch trout or a, you know, little peanut redfish or a 35 inch redfish. You always support the belly instead of hanging a fish vertically. I think in today's day and age, a lot of people know that. Um, it's something that we still see some people do, and we, we try to find an opportunity to educate them on the benefits of doing so. Maybe people don't know, but this conversation really stemmed from, you know, in Pat's recent recent trip, he caught a fantastic trout. And I, I remembered when I caught, I think that was your personal best, right, Pat? That was, I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. from the picture, that fish looked every bit of 28 inches. Like to yeah. be conservative, that was a really chunky yeah, it trout. It had a Mondo, but it was, it was massive. Yeah. yeah. It, it looked like a was trout. trout. It's a lifetime catch, man. I mean, it's something to be incredibly proud of. And I remembered mine, you know, my my biggest trout was about 30 and change in the lagoon, but it was the middle of summer. And truth be told, that fish did not survive. And it was heartbreaking to me. It's a whole story for another day. But the what I tried to do being in the kayak is I had it on a pair of lip grippers. I tried to keep it in the water as long as possible. In today's day and age, people want to remember this catch. They want to share it with their with their friends and family. They want to, you know, look back and see that fish. I'm still glad that I was able to, you know, get a picture of it. Fish didn't go to waste. I was within my legal limit to harvest, but my intention was not to harvest that fish. I wanted it to swim back and for other people to enjoy it. And I learned a very valuable lesson that day that really stuck with me in my whole life was 
all fish are a little bit different in the summertime in particular, man, it's just, it's so hot out. There's not nearly as much available oxygen in the summertime in shallow water in the peak part of the day, but you know, redfish, snook, trout, and tarpon, they all behave a little bit differently when you get them close to you. And what Pat and I talked about off, off this call was how do fish behave? What is their decorum when they're next to the boat? Most of the time, a redfish is pretty tired. And when you, when you fight a big snook, they're not flopping everywhere. When you get a snook next to the boat or the kayak or land, they're pretty tired. Like you whoop their butt, they're done. Snook, or I'm sorry, trout and tarpon are chaotic, like the entire time. Like even if they're tired, they could have one last bit of energy and just like snake on you. And it's so frustrating dealing with a big fish that you know is particularly delicate. And if you're, you know, the wade, the wade fishing guys, that's what we mentioned. The wade fishing guys probably have it the best because they're in the water. There's nothing that these fish can potentially fall out of our hands while we're holding them up for just a very quick three or four second picture and back in the water. They're not going to hit a kayak. They're not going to potentially hit a boat deck. You know, they, they don't have to worry about that aspect when they're in the water. If it kind of flops and just <laughs> keep it contained in the water. So trout and tarpon are just very energetic fish, even at the end of the fight. And they can surprise you. And it's in those moments, Pat, that they kind of wiggle and they, they slip out of your hands and back in the water. And we don't want to cause any harm to these fish, but we also want the opportunity to contain them to potentially take a picture of our personal best. So this, this was, this was of particular interest to me. I, I look back and all the lessons that I learned on that big trout and I've caught big ones in the past, but I always remember that big trout in particular were, were very, very delicate and they require more time on the revival. They require significantly less time out of the water, less handling as a whole. Um, but I can't say that it's still important to impart the same urgency for redfish and snook in any game fish, but they're, they're not all equal in their stress response. I think that's what the biggest thing was in our, our conversation. So what I kind of want to segue to real quick, guys, is like the, the means to be able to handle and, and hold and kind of contain your catch in a safe manner. And Pat, I want you to take this away because we talked about, first and foremost, as a whole, what's the safest way to contain a fish? And we think it's a net, right? We'd say that a soft net would be the way to go, but you had some you had some thoughts on that that I didn't even think about. Yeah, so, you know, when looking at that picture of that fish that I caught, another thing that, uh, that, I, realized, that, I, that I realized that when you look at the tail, the tail got kind of barred up and kind of damaged with the net. So I was using a rubber net, like, you know, like we're supposed to, no, no exposed nylon cord or anything like that. And I was holding the fish in the, in the net with it. But as it was thrashing around in the water, like you're talking about how trout do that, that thrash, you know, still at the boat. I mean, they, they don't give up. They, they, trout just don't give up, you know, they, they, they're not like redfish. And when it was in the net, it damaged itself. So, you know, not only do we need to, to look at, um, you know, having a rubber coated net, but also the size of the mesh. I mean, you've got a net right there that's got a small mesh size. The one that I have has a larger uh, mesh to it. So, you know, the, the tail was able to get in there and get messed up. That's the, that's really the better net to use something like that. Yeah. But I didn't even, I never even thought about that. Like I just thought a soft line rubber net was good enough. I didn't think about the mesh size, you know, like those bigger meshes kind of mar against the body of the fish. I never thought that was an aspect on handling big trout, but that, that was important. This is serendipitous. I, I, I was happy to come across a Plano floating net. I really like this guy. It's called a floating trout net, but it's really intended for smaller freshwater trout. Um, a lot of the fish I've been catching are bigger than this net. So it's a reminder, I need to get a bigger one, but that's, that's cool too. I never thought about the size of the mesh. I always thought the material really was, was the main factor here. Yeah. And anytime, yeah. yeah anytime you see a fish, uh, in a picture, or if you're catching yourself that in the tail, it almost looks like it's got little cuts in it, right? It's the best maybe what it's almost like it's got little fingers. And that's usually, you know, caused from a net. Some people think, oh, well, they, did something bite it? And then the tail, no, it, it's usually from, from that. It's from us. It's from humans, unfortunately, from anglers. Uh, yeah. So what, like, could you tell, like how, like what, walk us through what happened? Uh, so it's thrashing around next to your kayak and you could, and you actually see it like slicing up the tail. Well, when, when the fish uh, came boat side, you know, you get a real good visual of it. I, he came sideways and the, the fish was in perfect shape. You know, it was, you know, the way that it should, when I scooped it up in the net, I was, uh, clearing some stuff out of the way to, to bring it aboard. Uh, I have a Hobie kayak, which has pedals in it. 
And uh, a lot of times those pedals get in the way of, you know, pulling the, the larger fish with the big net and all that. Well, as I'm, I'm holding the net in the water and the fish is still in the net, I saw it thrashing around. And then I noticed the tail uh, kind of poke through the, uh, the mesh of the net. And then I realized that it didn't dawn on me until later on when I took a look at that picture again, and I saw exactly what you're talking about, where you've got the the tears and the and the and the tail and the fins. And then I realized, yeah, that did some damage to it. And you know, first thing that came to mind is I need to get a better net. I need to get a net with some some smaller mesh on it. So not just the the rubber, but also the smaller mesh that that uh, goes together as a pair to make sure these fish are protected. So let's let's talk about each one because I don't I don't think. I don't think this has really happened. I don't think no, that we've done even a video on each one because obviously, you know, you're going to, for me, a lot of times I like to lip a snook. You don't want to sit there. Obviously they got a gill plate uh, and, yeah. and trout, you know, many times have teeth. Uh, you you want to kind of uh, bring each of these fish on board a different way. Uh, let's just, let's just assume we don't even have a, a bug grip or a fish grip that all we have is, is a net. Uh, <laughs> what do you guys you start let's start with trout like so what what are you doing assuming well maybe we talk about a boat or kayak kind of walk us through the right way where are you grabbing them are you you're grabbing them by the eyeballs you're grabbing them by the tail by the belly what are you doing oh nostrils oh, no, the nostrils yeah it's a great way like a bowl no no so i kind of want to take this one because this is something that i think people see and they might not interpret what's going on in the moment with the angler and that is this sweet spot to be able to have your hands or rest your hands near the neck or, or the gills of the fish, but not in the gills, not in the filaments and the rakers. It's this V spot underneath the neck that with trout in particular, because they're so voracious, we're trying to prevent them from hitting something hard that can cause them more injury. And we want to be able to contain them. So this sweet spot that you see, if you see any of us as coaches or you know, any fisherman that's holding up a big catch and they have their hands resting close and some people might say, oh, they're in the gills. It's not necessarily in the gills and, and it's not our intention. It's to be able to have control over a fish in a way where we can actually get a grip on them. These are slimy things. Like they don't have arms and appendages and it's not always easy to get your fingers up underneath the underside of the peck fins either, especially if it's a big fat fish. So there's limited areas that you can really get control over these fish. And we there is kind of this sweet spot underneath the trout's chin whether you rest the flat part of your hand or you use two fingers and very carefully hold right here you're not trying to like put a death grip on you're not choking your trout you're just trying to get control over it so it doesn't hurt itself and then your other hand to be able to hold it up vertically or i'm sorry horizontally if you want to get a quick pick if you want to get a quick video session of it so that if that fish does move if it thrashes you have something to be able to contain it Otherwise, it's going to flop and it's going to hurt itself and it's going to cause itself more damage. But I think that to people outward looking in might see that and think, oh, they're hurting the gills. And, and, and that's definitely not what the angler wants to do. That's not what we're trying to do. We, we actually love and care about every fish we're trying to catch. So I think that we'll agree here that, that it is a sweet spot on redfish, on trout. Um, snook is, because mm, I got that sharp, gill raker that operculum that's really sharp and if they do thrash and move you can really cut up your hand they're more like a bass in salt water you, you can lip a snook it's a little bit different but you don't want to go around lipping redfish and, and trout you don't want piercings in your in your thumb yeah and and luke has been really cautious on even going up there in that little v just because of what you said people see him doing it and don't have the experience of kind of, it's, it's a feel, right? Of being like, you know, when you got it, you're like, okay, I got it. It's like a hanger. Uh, but if you miss it, I mean, you can miss it big time and all of a sudden now have your hands way up in the, in the gill plates. So like, so he, if you watch Luke now, he's trying not to do that just because it's tough to like tell someone in the heat of the battle exactly what he's doing. He's had someone on his boat saying, Oh, I was just copying you and not realizing what Luke was actually doing. So I'm glad I'm glad we're bringing this up because I don't think it's talked about en enough. So, so trout. It sounds like that's the way you're all for the most part always bringing them in, big or small. If if we don't have some sort of containment device like a boga grip or a lip gripper, and that's what Pat and I led back to is we see a lot of guys over in Texas, for instance, 
Y'all Texas guys got some big old trout over there. I mean, months, that is what the area is known for. And that's what you've been on the hunt for over there, Pat, for the yep. past five months is a big old juicy trout. And you got one. And we see, you know, some other pros out there that are getting really nice trout. And for the most part, they have a lip gripper to be able to contain in the mouth and hold the belly. And Pat and I, we asked ourselves a question like, is that a lesser of two evils to do that? Because the lip grippers are a great containment device. You know, I mean, they can grip down and when you finally lock them in place, I'm not going to do it because I'll probably break my hand, but on a much thinner membrane, you know, they can contain and hold the fish in place pretty well. But with how delicate a trout's, a trout's mouth is, if they thrash, is it causing more damage than keeping them contained in the net or keeping them in that sweet spot where we're, we were just talking about underneath the neck. And I think that for the wade guys, I mean, for the boat guys, if you don't feel comfortable in that sweet spot, if you feel that this is going to offer you more control to move with the fish, this might be a lesser of two evils and it might be an easier way to contain that fish in particular. These, this tool, a fish grip, great for redfish, great for snook. I mean, their, their jaws are a little more robust. Both of them are of any size. And it, this does help you contain your fish much easier than, than this, you know, uh, Vulcan death grip. I don't really know what to call it. Not even that. It's a, it's a specialty grip that we're all kind of referencing. And, and I keep going back to it because for those of you that are wondering, what does this look like? Look for it in future pictures, understand kind of what our approach is and, and why we're bringing that to light. But I think the lip gripper would be a good tool to contain fish. Um, if, if you feel like they're still wary and they might thrash about, and if you have it, I would say err on the side of using it. I think that, that is, that's a better alternative than, than some other means of handling a really crazy fish. Yeah. And it just, yes. it, it eliminates that flop on the boat or the deck or you know, even a kayak, you're a little bit lower, but we, it's all happened to us, right? And and for me, it seems like it seems like the smaller trout. And I've had podcasts where I feel horrible, and we're going live, so we we show that stuff, the good, the bad, the ugly. We learn from it, but they are they're slippery little guys, and all of a sudden I'm holding it, and it does that one little that last thrash, and it's flipping out of my hands, like, uh, and but, and even though you see it swim off, you I, I I'm not like we I know that's not good, like. Yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, being already worn out and then getting basically dropped from a, from a couple feet onto a hard boat deck. Uh, it's just, it's not good. I feel horrible. And, uh, you know, had I had lip grips, it worst case, it would have been held vertically for a second. But we're also talking about a small fish. And uh, that at least prevents that thing from completely uh, dropping on the, on the ground, which is just another big, big no, no. And it, it will happen if you fish enough, unfortunately, uh, especially with some smaller slimy trout. But uh, yeah, it's also avoidable if uh, if if you're if you take precautions or always prepared. Yep. Yeah, just put yourself in a situation where uh, you're putting yourself in the best situation where you you have all your tools available and uh, you know what to expect from that trout. You're, you expect they're going to be slimy, they're going to be slippery, uh, they're they're going to fight you back. So just keep all that in mind when you're handling the fish. And if possible, especially like on those smaller trout, you're not going to take a picture of them or anything like that, more than likely. Uh, just try to de-hook them on the outside of the boat, you know, just keep them in the water. And if you can get the, the hook out of their mouths in the water, just do it that way. That's that's the better choice for, for a smaller fish like that. Uh, you know, it, I think in any situation, unless you're trying to get a uh, picture of a fish, uh, the in the water de-hook is always the best. Uh, but it's those trophy fish that we're talking about, those ones that we want to get aboard and, you know, get that hero shot of, you know, you know, that big giant fish, uh, those are the ones that seem to cause us the most issue. With a bigger fish, like a trophy picture, are you trying to get the the lure? Assuming you're fishing with a lure, uh, like yeah, always. Like power pond, are you, are you getting the lure out first or are you keep it in for the picture? Uh, I try to keep it in for the picture, but sometimes I, I get a little ahead of myself and I take it out. But uh, th this morning I caught, a, I caught a really nice trout on a moonwalker and uh, the way that the trout was kind of thrashing around and uh, it, you know, with those hooks out there, I felt safer for me to take the lure out of its mouth before I took the picture. But I did get a picture of the fish uh, with the lure in its mouth in the net. So, you know, I know I know what was there on that. But, you know, as far as uh, I, I look at the situation, what's safest for me, what's safest for the fish, and then just do that. But you, yeah. Justin? I try to look at, um, I mean, I wouldn't consider it super selfish, but I try to look at it, what's safe for me. If it's trout in particular, a moonwalker is a perfect example. 
even if you have single in, inline hooks on that top water, it's pretty sketchy dealing with a big thrashing trout when you got hooks exposed. And I mean, that's the same, like even if it was a single hook, like an owner twist lock or, um, or a jig head as well exposed, like the minute they thrash and, and that hook or lure gets any kind of momentum, it caught in your leg, caught in your, your hand, your body. I think I have a little apprehension when I, when I deal with big trout. I try to keep them in the net at all times until I get a moment of reprieve where they're calm. I'll get a quick hero shot with the lure in or out of the mouth. I think is irrelevant. Get a quick hero shot. I tend to, if I have it in the mouth, in the lure in the mouth, just pop it out, keep it back in the net and try to revive it that way. And kind of what I want to cap this call off on is like the revival aspect of these fish too. So we're talking about the fighting aspect, like handling them next to the kayak or, you know, the boat or waiting and uh, the containment aspects of what are the best tools to use and what are some things to keep in mind. Um, the release is equally important. And what people need to realize is that all animals, fish in particular, but, you know, I worked with stingrays and sharks and I've worked with manatees and dolphins. You know, I, my, my, my prior life was in animal care, aquatic animal care. And the way that fish in particular, teleosts will work through lactic acid buildup in their body. It's kind of like going to the gym, doing leg day and not stretching you don't want to go up a flight of stairs. That would, that would suck. You need to stretch. You need to rest. You need to recover. So with every single fish you catch, uh, uh, whether for me, whether it's a 20 inch redfish or a 30 inch trout, I take my time and I try to revive the fish by very carefully grabbing the back of the tail. And I undulate the fish to the water. If I'm in current, for example, like if I was in Jacksonville or near a Creek where there's flowing water, I'll hold the fish into the current so that the water is ram ventilating and allowing water and oxygen to flow over its gills naturally. But I will still manually manipulate and kind of undulate that fish like a snake in the water to work out a lot of that built up lactic acid because they could kick away. And if it's, if it's in dirty water and you don't see it, but if they're not physically swimming and working that out, it's, it's going to cause them the bends. They're going to get some issues later on. So make sure that fish is all loosey goosey, you know, and let it, let it then decide to kick off on its own. You know, you don't ever have to shoo the fish away and let it swim. That fish will let you know when he wants to go. And at that point, they've decided on their own, like, I'm going to go survive and go eat some more lures <laughs> or hopefully real, real bait. But we hope lures in the future, too. <laughs> That's good. Um, I think a lot of people are probably still saying, all right, how do I take a good fish pick by myself? You guys for you know for the most part are out there every week in kayaks what what's what's the tip how do you guys get in good picks do you have a little mount i i learned it later than you pat you take it away <laughs> so, so basically uh the setup that i have when i'm out on the water fishing is i have a uh a gopro that is uh, on, a, on a head mount that's on uh, over my uh, over my hat that's the pov view that's uh showing all the action and then i also have a gopro that's on a mount that's in front of me on a kayak that I raise and lower it. So it's on a little boom. I'll uh, lower it down so it's not in the way. And then when I go to take that picture, again, this is after, you know, if I get the fish in the, uh, the net, the net's in the water, and then I'm pulling the, the camera up, you know, getting everything ready before I pull the fish out of the water. And uh, then I'll, I'll, you know, take my picture that way. Uh, actually, you know, it's video. I'll grab a screenshot of that video for the picture and then get them back in the net, get them revived and let them go. So it's a two camera setup. Uh, some people use their cell phone. They'll just put it on a forward facing camera and then touch it. But like Joe uh, mentioned earlier, you get slimy wet hands. Sometimes that's the best uh, option. Uh, but uh, the two GoPro setups seem to work out really good for me. Although now with this voice activated stuff, you know, Siri don't care about your fingers. Siri, <laughs> take a picture. <laughs> Siri's always listening to isn't she? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Almost to the point it's scary. Very scary. You start scrolling on your phone, you're like, Oh, look at that. It's more moonwalkers and uh, Alabama leprechauns for big trout. Series <laughs> whammy. He knows what's up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I was kind of late to the game. I mean, I did the whole like hold the fish out of my hand, kind of take a picture, but I've had fish flop on the kayak and that was just not the right way to go about doing it. So, you know, investing, we're all investing in rods, reels, lures, and everything for fishing. If you do catch that trophy catch, invest in a camera, whether it's a GoPro or a little digital camera, they're really not that expensive nowadays. You need a stand and you need a camera. And really this is the best for the guys that are in kayaks or boats from land by yourself or waiting by yourself. 
I can understand the challenge because you really don't have an apparatus to give yourself some distance to get that picture. Um, but for the most part, you know, you go wading with a buddy and your buddy can go out there and, and you know, be there with you. And, uh, you know, I always, I always try to fish with other people. Having somebody there with you to capture the shots, the best way to go. But if you're by yourself, if you're waiting or from shore, I end up thinking it's kind of a selfie or away from you. But, you know, if you're going to do that, try to do it in the water, you know, try to not do it to where the fish is going to fall onto the ground, where it's going to fall back into a net or fall back into the water. Um, and make sure whatever you're taking the picture with is a waterproof device. Uh, <laughs> even if your phone says waterproof, don't, don't risk it, guys. I've been there. <laughs> don't risk your phone. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, when, whenever I'm waiting, you can always tell the the pictures when I'm waiting. It's two arms holding a fish. That's all you see because you know I'm, I'm looking outward. I just basically hold it up to my head. So hey, look, I caught a fish, and then yeah, let it go that way. This one I caught on, got another gold digger, and then yeah, back in the water it goes. But yeah, there's not much you can do when you're waiting by yourself. Definitely makes it tougher. What else? Any other uh, things that mistakes or things that uh, you've seen that like? Oh man, I wish I could tell so and so this. I mean, for, for choosing to target fish, we kind of dabbled in this, but I prefer it, whether it's big reds, trout, snook or anything, if I don't intend on harvesting, um, even beyond handling or kind of even when you're, when you are handling single hooks, single hooks, like if you take a plug, for example, um, and you're using, you know, it could be a Marilure, it could be, uh, any kind of suspended plug or a top water. I think a lot of people are still used to the traditional treble hook thing. Man, nothing is scarier to the fishermen and nothing will, will cause more pain and holes in the fish than a bunch of troubles. So I'm a huge advocate. I know you are, Pat and Joe, for, for single hooks all the way. I get any hard bait that I have, even though I'm going for 100-pound tarpon, I've got some plugs. I got Miradine like XXLs, some really big soft twitch baits with single inline, 4 aught 3X strong single inlines, just because... I think that the connection point is better when you are hooked up to the fish. And when you do finally get them boat side or kayak side, way safer to deal with. So okay. that's that's my little tidbit takeaway. Yeah, one thing about inline hooks that a lot of people don't understand when you're fishing on a, uh, a hard bait is not only is the gap larger, so you get a better bite on that fish, the gauge of an inline hook is large in diameter, so you can pull them away from that structure if you have to. Whereas if you're, if you're uh, throwing trebles, uh, usually that's a smaller, weaker hook, and you know more than likely you're going to straighten that hook. So, yeah, without a doubt, I, I was okay. This is kind of going back in my bass days. I actually didn't like throwing crankbaits or anything like that because of the fact that I was in, on treble hooks. It wasn't until I moved into saltwater that I started throwing more hard baits because I did the uh, the inline you know single replacements, and that kind of opened up a, a different world for me. Love it. You did a quick little speed up there. All of a sudden, pets. Went. What was the episode that we did? It was the about like the guy from uh, Police Academy. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so, sound effects guy. You remember the movie? Oh. The movie's Police Academy. I, I, We've had yeah, this yeah. conversation. Yeah. Oh, I know I, Justin. I B. I don't, Pat, I don't think Pat was on that. It was it was Wyatt right? And Luke. No. Uh, oh, great flick. I think flick. I think you might have heard my cat. No. <laughs> <laughs> he, he decided to wake up. <laughs> too funny well cool anything else guys before we uh close this one up um i guess just a healthy reminder to everybody that you know even people that go out and intentionally target big fish peter deeks for example we see all the you know all the beautiful giant fish that he catches and holds up to the camera and has all these memories to share with his clients he's had many many years of doing this I would fair to say even Peter Dinks has times where he might fumble. Like no, nobody's perfect as a fisherman. It's going to happen at times where a fish will slip out of the hands and drop and fall. And, and we know that it happens to all of us. What we're trying to teach here is how to be able to do it better, how to prevent it, acknowledge that it does happen, but we're all trying to find better ways to prevent it from happening altogether. So don't feel alone. And I don't feel like, Oh man, I'm a failure. Like we've all done it. Yep. Another good tip that Luke has been good about doing is just grabbing it by the tail. Like if it's a snook, red, whatever. It, and cause the second you have it by the tail and lift it out a little bit, it can't swim anywhere. It's literally, so now it's nose is literally in the water. It's breathing and you got it by the tail and then you come underneath and pull the sucker out. And so you'll see a lot of Luke's pictures. And then he'll, he'll kind of switch his hand real quick. So he's still kind of grabbing the tail and holding the belly. Another great way to do it. If you're having yeah. trouble with, what did you call it? The, 
the V, the the neck. Was it as a goozle? Is that what it is? A goozle. 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 Vicious goozle. That's our, that's our $5 word. I like that. There you go. Uh, so, so one thing I, I'd like to, to leave you with is um, even if you're taking a picture of a fish that you plan on harvesting, it's always a good idea to show good fish handling uh, in a picture, even if you're going to harvest that fish. Because if it gets out there on social media, it's just a repetitive thing. Uh, the more people see the, the correct way of handling the fish, the more it'll stick. So you know, you start seeing people taking those lip rippers that we talk about and they're hanging that fish down from its jaw. Yeah, you might be able, you might be harvesting that fish, but it kind of sends a wrong message. Uh, so even if you're going to harvest that fish, uh, you know, in, in, in the pictures, you want to handle uh, proper fish handling skills. Yeah, it, it's it's habits too, right? I mean, you yeah. you get better and improve upon what you practice. And so if you're mm-hmm. practicing the right way, you will get better. You'll You'll have a better feel for it. And that's the way you learn. So it's good. Absolutely. Cool. Well, guys, hopefully you found this uh, helpful. Definitely share this. We, uh, we're not calling anyone out and, uh, and, and nor do we sit there and try to point fingers and, and start conflict on social media when we do see that. Uh, but, you know, this is just a good reminder. And we try to do this every once in a while, just uh, especially for, uh, for people who are new and maybe, maybe saw that trophy fish that was, you know, hung up uh, vertically and uh, said, oh, what's well, so-and-so did. It was a big fish. I'll, I'll do it that way as well. Just a, a great reminder to get everyone in the habit of doing it the right way and, uh, and ensuring that, you know, our kids and grandkids have the same top of opportunities we did, catch a bunch of fish. And if you're into creating memories and into catching fish faster, we had a pretty cool club uh, getting real close to 30,000 members in our Salt Strong Insider Club. And, and really we have two big things that we try to accomplish, right? Two massive benefits and one is saving you time. We realized after working out with tens of thousands of inshore saltwater anglers, the number one thing that we saw for is time, right? Because we're all busy, right? We all have lives, we got jobs, we got stuff going on and our fishing time is super valuable. We've invested so much money in it. So it makes sense. You want to maximize your time, but yet you don't have time to sit there and watch five hours of videos every time you hit the water. So we try to boil everything down in 10 minutes or less per week. So it's kind of our promise that if we have everything, obviously we have, we do have three hour long master master classes you can watch, but if you just want an edge over the fish and your fishing buddies, and you want to go out there with confidence, then all you need is 10 minutes. You can literally listen to it on your phone or like literally have it synced up to your truck, your car on the way fishing to the ramp or on the, you know, on the way to brushing your teeth. I mean, you literally just have it on and watch or listen to, to Luke and the other coaches just curate exactly where you should be fishing every week. And we do it every Friday morning, 52 uh, Fridays uh, a year, every single Friday morning we do that. And it's, it's like having a fishing guide in your back pocket. It literally will shorten the, le- the learning curve and it'll give you a heads up. The, even if you're pretty good, it still gives you some, some leverage over everyone else because you'll have someone who's been on the water who's seeing all these reports and who's studying everything is is, in in terms of trends and weather and the wind direction all that to say all right here's the exact types of spots you want to be fishing and here's the exact types of lures or bait that you want to be using to maximize your results so that's all it's the salt strong insider club it's saltstrong.com the other thing i mentioned time is money we all like buying tackle. Justin, you like buying tackle, don't you? Probably more than anybody else on here. <laughs> oh, boy. Pat, that's a challenge. Pat loves buying yeah. tackle. I love buying tackle. We all love buying tackle. And so now that we have 30,000 members, we've been able to go out there and get some really nice discounts on a lot of the best tackle out there. And we pass all that savings on to our members. Kind of like Costco, right? People spend the $125 for the gold level Costco to be able to go out there and, and to buy in bulk and to save money. We even have things like that, like the hundred pack of slam shadies and we're working on a hundred pack of power prawns and hundred pack of gold diggers and hundred pack of, of slam shady bombers have been selling like, uh, like crazy. And, uh, and, and obviously we're giving you know, 20 or even 30% off everything there in the store. So save you money, save you time. If that sounds like it interests you, then come join us in the 30,000 other hardcore fun, loving, and, uh, and just super positive insider members over at saltstrong.com. And we got some really cool stuff coming with this software. Uh, oh my gosh, like next level. I, I believe one of the coolest things that we've done as a club with some, uh, some software that's gonna basically eliminate the need 
for you to be on your phone on like five different apps, right? So I'm talking like wind, radar, sonar, the the weather, literally everything, satellite maps, all into one place, helping you predict exactly where you should be fishing every single every single trip. It's going to be really really phenomenal. So join us there at saltshore.com and. We will have this on the blog post. You might even be there right now. And at the bottom, you'll see a place to leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Pat would love to hear from you. He loves getting comments. There you Justin, go. you like comments? Yeah, bring Justin, it on. Justin's a comment guy. I always thought <laughs> I, like, I like everybody. Like, I'm a likable guy. Yeah. He loves giving out hugs. So yeah, if you want a virtual hug from Justin and Pat, sit there on the saltstorm.com slash fishing tips section. You'll see the blog post there. You can leave us a comment. There's probably something we missed, or if you have little tips that you have used to uh, to help ensure the longevity of the fish we're releasing, let us know. And of course, give a shout out to Release Over 20. They do a fantastic job. Uh, they're promoting this you know, release and, and proper tactics, et cetera. And uh, that's a, just a really cool program. They give away cool little stickers and, uh, and, and a lot of great ways to recognize the anglers who are releasing the bigger fish, which in many cases are the bigger breeders, and that just helps the soul cycle continue on while we're catching fish. So thank you guys so much, Justin, Pat. Great job here on this one. And, um, and Pat, yeah, awesome catch on the, on that trial. Oh, it, it's cool to watch the game film. It's something else that we do uh, to learn from this, right? The good, the bad, the ugly. And uh, that was really kind of how this whole thing was spawned. So that was cool. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate I that. appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Peace. We out. Woo-woo. Bye. Cause vision, it's in my soul It was passed down to me from the days of old You'll find us on the water if there was a way It's been said my papa, he wrote the book On catching big reds and 20 pounds snook I wish I knew all the things he So